Well, we're super excited to be here today to share a uh, revenue growth framework that's designed to help teams do really two things. So one, build an achievable plan that aligns with growth expectations, and two, provide guidance on how to track execution against that plan as we're moving through the rest of 2024. So we build this plan initially, and then how do we track performance against those targets that we established whenever we created the plan? So today I'm super excited to be joined by Megan Cashiopo, um, head of marketing at LeapPoint, uh, where she is affectionately known as Cash because all of her marketing programs lead to revenue. And also Dr. Dan Patterson, founder at Multiply, um, and a serial entrepreneur who's brought innovation to every market, every market he touches. And I'm Paul Self with Multiply GTM as well, and I'll be your, your, your MC today. So let's jump into what this framework actually is. And there's really four phases or steps within this framework. And the two first two steps are driven primarily around the, or tied primarily around to the, the, the planning process itself. So what is my current capability? This is our starting point. So how have we historically performed and how can I use that as the basis of the plan that I'll build for next year? Or even if I'm building a multi-year strategic plan, how am I going to use that historical performance as a way to inform the planning process and evaluate if that plan is achievable? The second step in this process is just making sure, do we have an achievable plan based upon my historical capabilities? And it's also the opportunity to get teams aligned on what exactly we're going to go and execute against in 2024 to make sure that we're actually going to be able to hit those growth targets. And then the second two steps are really in the, um, the execution phase. So how do we have pro progress as I'm moving through the execution phase? What happens in the, in the fourth step during the validation phase? What happens if things don't necessarily go to plan? Because best laid plans, we know they don't always go as we, as we expect. How do I model alternate scenarios? So those last two steps give us the opportunity to take the information that we leveraged when we built our plan, the assumptions that we used when we built our plan, and actually track our progress progress against those. So with that, I think we'll jump into um, our vital step, Dan, and you can walk us through. Yeah, thank you, Paul. So um, as you mentioned, the vital step is the first of four steps. And really, this is sort of a, it's a precursory step. So we're going to walk through the process of uh, building out a GTM plan and tracking during execution, and then uh, either remediating or staying on track as step four. But this precursory step is, is a really key part to the process because what it's designed to do is establish a baseline. Um, you know, it, it, there's no point developing a plan if you don't develop that plan in context of your capability. So the way this first step works is very, very simple. Um, first of all, we analyze, or well, the platform actually analyzes performance to date. So it's able to interrogate uh, things like uh, revenue achievement, um, either over the last year or, or as of today. Um, likewise, it looks at deal volume. How many deals have we been able to close? Likewise, it looks at things like deal value. Now. Those three examples are examples of how we are performing. Um, I think it's more important though, when we're, when we're considering um, what is our current capability and performance to look at the work we've actually expended in order to achieve the revenue, the deal volume and the deal value. And so in addition to those three sort of outputs, if you like, we also consider, for example, how much, uh, how much work was involved perhaps from the marketing organization in generating sufficient leads in order to hit our revenue number. Um, and we look at that from a, from a lead volume perspective. We also consider it from a velocity perspective as well. In other words, well, how long did it take from a lead to go from initiation through the customer acquisition journey all the way through to a, to a closed one? And so the way this works is we combine the uh, the top-down results, the revenue deal, deal value with the, the, the efficiency, lead volume, velocity, the inputs, if you like. And that forms the basis of really a baseline. 
and that baseline actually gets scored. So we, we, we support the framework with an index. We call it the multiply GTM index. And the index is a measure, really it's a measure of achievability. Think of it as um, sort of your, your, your leap index. How big a leap will it take for us to achieve our forthcoming plan or our goals for next year? Well, in order to understand how big a leap, we first of all need to establish our current capability. And that's exactly what this first step is all about. Add maybe one more sort of bullet point to that. So um, we'll, we'll get into the details of the index as we go through the, uh, the session. But um, in summary, um, it's a, a finite um, range, if you like, from zero to 200. Um, baseline is our, our, our sort of neutral point, the, the 100 score. I think what's really useful about the index is it's not just a measure of um, how aggressive or how achievable is our plan. It's also very valuable in being able to um, raise a flag and say, actually, your plan is perhaps not as aggressive as it should be. In other words, you're potentially selling yourself short relative to your, your capability today. So, um, and I think it's important to understand it's a, it's a bi-directional type measure looking at both aggressiveness and achievability, but also acting as a safety net in case your plan could actually be more ambitious, basically. It was always right. that smart, <laughs> right? Um, but I think over the, the course of my career, I've, I've dealt with a couple different ways of planning. I'm going to focus probably more on the wrong way <laughs> to go about it because... Yeah, so what so are the pitfalls? Yeah, what are the things that, you know, we've all yeah. made these mistakes, right? Well, yeah. Uh, first one, gut feeling, right? Like I have been in an or organization where they just gave me a top line revenue number for, for the org and then said, all right, figure out, figure out what you can deliver. Well, like, Yikes, <laughs> that that was not fun. Um, or I've been in other organizations where we've leveraged uh, a really like rigid or clunky demand waterfall to define our targets. But that way of planning really only takes into consideration pure lead generation and not any of the rest of what gets done in marketing, demand creation, brand building, ungated content, <laughs> you can't, you know, totally measure. Mm -hmm. um, really didn't factor in that most deals are made up of multiple decision makers and they each have their own unique buyer journeys. Um, and probably one of the, the worst parts of planning that way is it led to misalignment uh, between marketing and sales because I would get so laser focused on hitting that top, you know, MQL number and conversion rate. And I probably shouldn't admit this, but I will, but it led to a lot of what I would call poor marketing choices where we were simply kind of pumping the funnel full of, you know, quote unquote MQLs that weren't really qualified, or we ended up spending budget on, you know, companies that would claim to be able to book you sales qualified meetings, but we all know how that ends up. So uh, live and learn, right? Um, so that, that was one of the pitfalls. Um, one of the other ones that I might mention is during the annual planning process, not considering different product lines or teams or even geographies and kind of treating that marketing goal and budget as one big lump sum. So when I ran demand generation at a, a reputable PPM software company a while back, I was actually responsible for three different product lines and two geographies, um, the US and the UK. So each year when I would plan, I would force my sales leaders to get really granular with me. So, you know, we would look at, okay, all right, for product A, what are we trying to achieve? What about product B? And then, okay, what's that split across geographies? And then from there, I'd be able to look at my marketing budget and say, all right, if we're trying to achieve this goal for product A, then I need to allocate X percent of my budget and my time to marketing that product. Um, of course, it wasn't always an exact science, but it certainly helped me quantify what I needed to achieve, um, you know, better than than just operating kind of on that gut. Um, and then a similar pitfall is, is knowing when you need to generate those leads, right? So, for instance, here at Lead Point, Q4 is our, our biggest quarter. So, I, you know... I need to identify based on, you know, what you were talking about, average sales cycle, average lead conversion, mm -hmm. when do I need to have a heavier concentration of lead flow? And without that level of intelligence, you sort of, it goes back to that, I'm just operating off of gut, right? It's like, okay, sure, let's do a bunch of events in January because that sounds like a good month, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, I don't know, maybe my favorite or, or should I say least favorite pitfall is just unrealistic expectations of achievement. Um, I, I remember... Um, 
at one company, I was responsible for 60% of all pipeline generation. But then when I got my marketing budget, I was like, uh, okay. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like I was going to have to deliver 4,000 MQLs and I had like a dollar per lead to it, which is just impossible. like impossible, yeah. right? Uh -huh. um, and then the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention is not planning early enough, right? You know, if, if you're, if you're looking in December at the following year, you're always going to be at least a quarter behind playing catch up. So, um, I think that might actually lead us into our next topic around vision. Um, so, you bet. So vision is all around, all about building the plan. And um, it was, I was, I was chuckling, Megan, when when you said, uh, you know, previously you'd been given a top line number and basically told to go and figure out how close to that number you could get. Um, in my mind, that's analogous to managing a construction project and having a, a, a fixed start date and just hoping that we finish on a on a date. But there's there's a huge degree of uncertainty on that finish date. Um, I think that's backwards. I think from a planning perspective, we should put a stake in the ground and said no, and say, you know, we're going to finish on this date. Let's work backwards and figure out when we should start. Well, the same thing applies to GTM planning. And that's exactly how the, the planning process works within Multiply GTM. So this is very much a uh, what we call a goal seek type um, model. So the, the goal is, uh, for example, uh, next, year's, next year's revenue target. And then the way the planning process works, um, it's actually closed loop. And just to elaborate on that a little bit, um, on the left-hand side of the screen, we see this, um, this circle where we have revenue leading to leads, leads leading to deals, deals leading back to revenue. So it's a very simple but very, very effective way of developing an aligned marketing and sales plan uh, that is tied at the hip and is, is consistent. So from a, from a starting point, um, we start with a goal seek, we have our, our target revenue number. We first of all do a bottom up analysis where we walk from revenue, we walk backwards through the funnel to determine how many leads are required to support that revenue number. Now that, that bottom-up calculation is certainly not anything new. However, I think where we're really pushing the boundaries here is once we've done that bottom-up from revenue to lead volume determination, we then do a U-turn and we do a top-down from the required marketing leads and we translate that back into the resultant number of deals. Now from there, those deals, of course, based on uh, the average sales price of the deal, will then drive revenue. So the net of that is we have an integrated bottom up from our goal back into the marketing organization to get us leads. We then do top down from leads back into the sales organization. Those two steps within the cycle result in two plans being generated, our marketing plan and our sales plan. Now, Again, I think what is so um, powerful in terms of driving towards an optimal plan is the fact that this process is iterative. And the reason why it needs to be and is iterative is that there are what we call impact drivers that affect the relationship between revenue leads and deals. So as we're building out the model, the platform or the software will help establish these two plans, but then as a team, both a marketing team and a sales team, we can review and critique the characteristics of those two plans and essentially either buy into them or push back. And our decision as to whether to buy in or push back is driven by some of the, the, the metrics that we see at the bottom of the screen here. So, you know, we get insight into uh, volume and it's not just volume of leads, it's volume of deals, how much lead generation activity is required. Mm -hmm. If we are uncomfortable with that volume, and again, this goes back to comparing, for example, required lead volume in the plan to what we've been able to achieve in our prior year. If we're well, again, that, mm -hmm. we can optimize and adjust those levers, the plan will adjust accordingly, but again, it will uphold it. It's always watertight. So the relationship between revenue leads and deals is always sound. So again, 
Same thing applies to velocity. Um, this is really all about timing. You know, have we, does the plan accommodate sufficient time for, for example, Megan's organization to generate the leads in order to uh, support perhaps the quarterly sub goals that we have in our plan? Um, it also takes into account value and cost. Um, Megan, you mentioned sort of the, the extreme cost per MQL, I think. Um, well, the, the plan will actually reveal both how much value each lead carries, but also how much money will need to be invested per lead in order to support the deal, the deal uh, quantity, which then drives the revenue. So this concept of iteratively improving towards this optimal plan, I think is really, really valuable in, in this process. The, the consideration and the importance of recurring revenue, um, you know, the model helps reveal or appeals back the um, the contribution that either a prior year recurring existing revenue has on lessening the burden on lead generation and new sales for this year, but also the impact of new sales this year um, rolling forward in a recurring manner as well. So sort of reverse calculating and peeling back from your top line and, and whittling it down to, okay, how much true new lead generation do we need to support new sales um again is, is is incredibly powerful the the idea that this establishes some really clear expectations and it allows the team the opportunity to say is this realistic or not right we don't want to create a plan that out of the gate is entirely unachievable because we're ramping too fast or we don't have appropriate budget to actually do the demand generation activity that we want we don't have the capacity on the sales team to handle um, the volume of, you know, qualified leads that may be coming in to the, you know, to the BDR or, or SDR teams if we're in a sales like growth motion. Yeah. So, so Megan, you brought up a really, really key concept and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of translate uh, your description of it, but, but in my mind, it translated to, you know, goodness takes time to come to fruition, you know, it, it and, and that's exactly what this, uh, this Gantt chart is showing at the bottom here, you know, the, the blue segments are showing, um, the required timing from a lead uh, generation perspective, but then of course leads take time to to nurture and convert. Um, so it's one thing to uh, create leads at a given point in time, but then you have to take into account that conversion time, which is the the orange and the brown segment. And so, again, in my mind, that the key to building a successful plan is it's all about working backwards from the goal allowing sufficient nurture time um, so that when when we actually execute the plan and we roll forward, um, we've we've essentially time phased accordingly is really what this is all about. Right. And and for someone like Megan, this is great too, because um, she knows that she's having to do activity in Q4 of this year to support her objective in Q1 of next year. And I think what's so cool about the closed loop planning process is it it forces teams to get aligned because as you're going through this process, you're going to establish go-to-market performance targets that you will ultimately and should track execution against. Um, and everyone has to buy into that. Um, and if they don't, you have the opportunity then to, to adjust those levers, right? Um, if we think our conversion rates are overly aggressive, if we think there's a market condition that's going to change, that's going to extend our sales cycles, um, we can take those things into consideration now so that the entire team is aligned around what really needs to be done to support an achievable plan. You know, our, our initial um, uh, baselining, that, that was our um, calibration that got us to the, to the 100 mark on, on, the, uh, on the index. So, so think of that as sort of your, well, if I continue as I am today, within reason, I can just keep, keep going. And, th and that gets me, you know, within sort of the 100 range. Um, to the right of that, what we're really striving for um, is to move more into sort of the bandwidth of around the 150 mark where it's aggressive, but it's still achievable. And I think one of the nice things about the index is as you get closer to the 200 mark, it starts to sort of raise a flag and say, well, actually the achievability is, is so low that you should probably recalibrate. And then again, the same applies on the other end of the scale from the 100 down to the zero you know, if, if you're if really, if you're less than 75, 
you should seriously challenge yourself on um, pushing yourself harder. Um, and then in the extreme, you know, if, if, if the plan is so conservative, then you know, anything less than 25, then uh, you're really doing yourself a, a very strong disservice. So using these bandwidths as guides and, and pushing yourself, but not pushing yourself so hard that you do what I call an Icarus and stall mid-flight, I think is really powerful. Advice around getting buy-in from stakeholders, or how do you how do you truly get alignment kind of in the real world? Yeah, well, I think this is great because this gives you like the actual, you know, targets that you need to hit. And then from a marketing perspective, you can take that, right? And then translate that into your full-blown, you know, marketing plan. And so I think you know, it doesn't matter if that's, you know, in a Word document, a PowerPoint, whatever, but you, you have to have a marketing uh, marketing plan that defines, you know, how you're going to get to that goal. And it needs to be shared and accessible by all. Um, because the truth is, we, you know, especially these days, right, we cannot do this alone. So, um, you know, a couple of maybe advice that I've learned throughout the years doing this is you got, you have to get executive buy-in, right? And you need to be clear um, when presenting your plan to that team. Um, CEO, CFO, they're not going to understand, right, all the different buzzwords that we're using. But you need to explain mm -hmm. each element of the marketing plan is to contribute to, to the overall goal and the business objectives and why it's necessary. Um, here at Leap Point, our CEO actually has, um, he, he calls them five corporate objectives. And so when I was building out um, my plan last year, I made sure to articulate how that marketing plan was going to touch on every single one of those. And it shows that marketing is not operating in a silo, but, you know, is really a key driver uh, for the company's overall success. Um, another piece of advice is um, showcase data and analytics. I, I wish I had had this at, at a previous organization I was at because I, I was at a startup. They'd done almost zero marketing. Um, the sales leader I was working with was really more of a like a general manager versus a traditional sales exec. So I had a really steep hill to climb in terms of getting them to understand, you know, the, the marketing plan. And in that situation, I didn't have historical data. I wish I had this, right, <laughs> to be able to very clearly articulate here, where we need to go. Um, but, you know, wherever you can um, to use that data and analytics to help make your case. Um, and then being able to present a clear ROI by channel, right? Um, the executive team, they're going to want to know what the return on investment is. Um, you know, I'm not obviously suggesting that you need to be tracking the ROI of individual, you know, blog posts, right? Um, but be prepared to show how those these strategies are going to lead, you know, lead to achieving these goals, the increased revenue, acquisition, you know, other business benefits. Um, and one critical piece is really involving the executive team in the planning process. So when I started at the I met with all the different execs and I, I included them, um, which I really think gave them a sense of ownership um, over the marketing goals. And it also made them more likely to support them, because um, as I mentioned from the get go, right, marketing cannot do 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 this alone. Um, and then maybe the last piece of advice I'll, I'll, I'll leave with here is is communicate. Right. So getting in is not a one-time task, right? But it's an ongoing process of communication and collaboration. Um, and you need to champion your successes or, or you know, failures maybe um, with, with a remediation plan um, loudly. Um, I know it's not always easy, you know, for us as marketers, especially me. I usually like to be more behind the scenes, um, but it's really important. Um, and it can be something as simple as kind of a weekly or monthly update that's highlighting um, these trends and the metrics, right? How are we, uh, how are we uh, achieving, you know, according to plan? Where might we mean what, whoo, excuse me, where might, might we need to make some adjustments? Um, and then I think that kind of maybe leads us again into, into the next step. Right? So Paul, I want to challenge the status quo on this one. So okay. three, we call it voyage. It's all about measuring progress. Um, I don't think measuring progress by tracking outputs, for example, how are we doing with regards to revenue or how is our deal value compared to our plan think that gets to the root cause if for whatever reason we're veering off course um, you know you, you don't you don't alter an outcome by changing the outcome you alter an outcome by looking at what's impacting the outcome and then you fix it um, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what we're doing in this third stage here so yes we do consider 
Um, you know, things like bookings and revenue performance and deal value and number of deals. Did we hit our tar targets, et cetera? We use those as flags. And if those flags are raised because those numbers are out of whack, then we dive into the drivers. And that's really key here because, again, the, the model can determine um, which drivers are most causing us to be misaligned or miss our sales target or to, to miss our plan. And if we can pinpoint those, we have a much stronger chance of addressing them, which then you know gets us into, into remediation and uh, getting back on track, as it were. So you know, tracking performance, think of this as sort of a it's a it's a twofold insight, and, and um, you know, the, the scorecard at the bottom here shows that. Um, but uh, but I would just very strongly urge to not just consider the outputs, but to put more emphasis to the inputs um, and use those as early um, early warning indicators um, and use those indicators to get to get back on track. So you know, yes, we're tracking um, execution performance. I think what, what's a little bit different about our approach though is going beyond just looking, like I said, looking beyond just the outcomes but actually interrogating the reason why. And, and what we've found um, through these models in the last 18 months is that um, there is a high degree of complexity with regards to the relationships between the impact drivers and the outcomes. It's very rare that, for example, there is a one-to-one a -one or a linear relationship between perhaps lead volume generated and revenue volume achieved because there are so many interdependent variables um, that drive your gtm plan it's impossible certainly on a piece of paper and very very hard even in, in a spreadsheet to understand those relationships and again that's that that's where the power of the modeling comes into play within the platform and 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 um like the kind of the very simple example that we have on the screen right i mean we we miss our bookings target by 15%. So we're only 85% of plan, but we, you know, we know the outputs are we missed our plan, but we actually pulled at a higher annual contract value than we originally intended. We from the from an inputs perspective, it looks like we actually, you know, built up the pipeline, the right head of steam in order to get there. Um, but the reality is is that we weren't converting as fast, right? So the velocity was suffering. So while we may have still built a really strong pipeline, we're just seeing a push or a shift in those deals and the extension of the sales cycle that's causing us to miss those targets we originally we originally established. So it's like, it's no more searching for a needle in a haystack. I know yes. the process of once we're actually into execution, leveraging the information that we built as part of that initial planning process, um, to track performance against I mean, you know the, the chart in the bottom left uh, traditionally known as a radar chart I think of this as sort of our Achilles heel report it, it's incredibly um, effective at literally pinpointing where you need to focus your efforts um, to um, you know, uphold uphold your plan and if you're falling short of plan here's where you need to focus being able to pinpoint right is so important because i think sometimes as marketers like if things are going off course it's so easy to just say like all right let's dump a bunch of money into top of the funnel right or like oh we need more leads but do you really you know like this gives you that insight you know in that example that you showed on the previous slide paul it wasn't that that you know the the top of the funnel pipeline building it was that it's taking too long to convert them right and so that puts your focus from a marketing standpoint somewhere else right? and so i think it's i love that, that that it gives that visibility um some of the other things you know definitely um measuring you know lead volume like you, you guys you know mqls sqls that timeline for generation the conversion rates um also looking at total like customer acquisition cost um mm -hmm. and, and and keeping that number, you know, as low as possible relative to, to customer lifetime value. I look a lot like daily, right, at opportunities, <laughs> number of opportunities generated, um, dollar value, and then percent of contribution, you know, to overall pipeline. Um, and then, you know, some may call them more vanity metrics, right? But looking at engagement, you know, like shares, comments, video views, interactions, um, you know, with more and more content being ungated, these days, it's, it's it's effective to know what messages are resonating um, and with what audiences and and where where I might need to pivot. Um, 
And then looking, I think the key here too is looking at all of these together, right? Because it's going to give you a more holistic picture um, and, and help you drive to, to being a little bit more mature um, in your planning process, right? So and if, you're, if you're not measuring, right, you're not going to be able to make well-informed decisions. And that takes us to the validation step, which is a best laid plans. Inevitably, something's not going to go to plan. So now we're <laughs> It, it does, and, and we, we've somewhat touched on um, towards the back end of, of step three, but you know, validation is all around um, if we're not performing as per plan and we're deviating from the plan, um, giving us insight into what should we do next? Should we um, continue or what would be the outcome if we continue to under, underperform? If we're not satisfied with that outcome, what would it take? for us to get back on track. And the concept of getting back on track is very interesting because again, because the model is a goal seek, um, step four here will actually generate a plan that shows us how much acceleration, how much additional effort, work, investment, time, et cetera, is needed to, to bridge the gap, to bridge, to, to bridge that shortfall. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very powerful because um, then we can make an informed decision as to, you know, is that achievable? Can we afford it? Do we have sufficient time? And I think one of the, the powers of step four, it overcomes the, the issue or, or, the, or the characteristic, I guess, in that there are multiple ways to get back on track. There isn't one perfect path through to a given goal. Um, and Paul, I'm laughing because I promised I wouldn't talk about wicked. I was gonna problems. say you're gonna say wicked problem. I know you're gonna say wicked problem. About wicked problem. So a wicked problem um, is something that cannot be definitively solved through a single solution. Um, so you know, it, translating that, it basically means there's multiple paths that get you back, and that's really difficult. Um, it gives you opportunity, but it's also very difficult because you don't know which path to to follow. And so by um, by the model generating those scenarios, those alternate paths, then again, then using the impact driver analysis, the Achilles heel or the radar chart we, we saw on the previous screen, using that, we can make a decision as to which of those scenarios or paths we, we follow. We, we've talked about validation being sort of a remediation and a get back on track. Um, in some ways, that's a bit negative because there are instances where we execute um, over plan. And in, and in that case, you know, if we're executing above and beyond plan, you know, one, one scenario that we really should consider is, well, you know, should we, should we continue to stretch? Let's generate a stretch goal scenario and look at what it would take to, to achieve that. And again, these scenarios are all supported by the index. So, you know, understanding the achievability of these alternate scenarios, whether it's a remediation plan or a stretch goal plan, again, gives us massive insight and, and, and it, it allows us to make an informed decision as to how we go forward. Um, sort of a value add, I guess, in step four. It, it, it's an extension of uh, you know, replan, remediation, validation. And, and what it is, is it's an analysis as to how robust or, or how sturdy is our plan? And, and what I really mean by that is, you know, we have our, our plan laid out, um, but a plan could very easily collapse. It could be very fragile based upon one of those impact drivers that we, we mentioned. You know, is my plan incredibly sensitive to um, the velocity or the, the, the time it takes to convert a lead? Is my plan very sensitive because it's highly dependent upon um, an enterprise product offering that generates a low deal volume, but very high impact on the overarching revenue number. Mm -hmm. And so understanding the sensitivity of each of the drivers and how they push or perhaps don't push the outcome is really, really powerful. So, um, you know, I, I call this the wiggle analysis, Paul. On the left-hand side, we've got the, the drivers. These are the things that can vary. And the power here is that we can run what-if analyses and say, okay, well, what if 
our unit price uh, for our onboarding package increased, or what if we increased the, 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 the unit price by 15%? What if we um, improved our customer retention by 5%? By okay. applying those what if levers on the left hand side, the model will actually determine and, and reveal for us, as you can see with the little dials, the impact on, on the outcome. And, and so, again, this is helping overcome the complexity of the fact that the impact drivers do not have a linear relationship. They don't have a one-to-one -one relationship with the outcome. You know, our simple example, a 10% increase in lead volume absolutely doesn't mean that we will, we will experience necessarily a 10% increase in revenue. And so by exploring those adjustments, we can very quickly, again, make informed decisions. We can run scenarios and then um, as a team decide which one to march to. That validation step, it's, it's just confirmation that planning never stops, right? So Megan, what, what levers are you kind of uh, looking at when potentially course correction is required or, you know, when things don't necessarily uh, go to plan? How, are, how, do you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I think it can, you know, depend a little bit, um, but, uh, you know, having having the insight that, that this offers, right? Like, so you can see, are there product lines maybe that your business sells that are maybe a quicker time to close where you could double down on promotions, right, to, to, to make up that gap? Um, where are your highest converting leads coming from? Can you put a little bit more budget there, put a little bit more effort there, right, versus some of the other, back off on some other channels um, so that you're being a little bit smarter about and or you know implementing more you know abm centric tactics to minimize that marketing waste and, and lower, lowering your your cost per lead um i love this because it's, just, it's, it's we all want sometimes we want an easy button right it's like how do i fix it i'm behind and and so often we don't have that level of, level of intelligence and so being able to plan in this way is so so important um you know i can think of multiple examples but but you know i would always love when when a sales leader would come to me at the end of the quarter and be like, all right, we're behind on our goal. What's marketing going to do to get us over the finish line? And I'd laugh because I'm like, man, what I'm doing is already too much, you know, like, I'm doing, that, like, but I'm doing all the things to make sure you don't miss, you know, next quarter's goal. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, having, having that insight is, is really, um, really helpful. And I think another area where having a quantifiable plan is important is, is, you know, if things get tight, right? Like leadership comes to you and says, hey, you know, we're going to cut your marketing budget, you know, without a plan, you can't show the impact that that's going to have, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you can, you know, and, and you clearly show like, look, we have to generate this amount in this time period. And if we cut that, it's going to impact future quarters by, you know, X amount. Um, that's going to make a big difference, right? They might think those cuts and, and anything you can, where you can show, you know, numbers and the true impact of what's going to happen will make a big difference. Um, and then I think, you know, the other thing I would just say is, um, remember, you're always going to have to make pivots, right? But you also need to make sure that you're giving things the time and the space to work. Um, you know, I'm certainly not saying set it and forget it, but, um, you know, too much pivoting can also have a negative impact as well. So the ability to kind of run alternate scenarios and things like that is 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 really eye-opening, you know, in, in, in order to be able to show what levers you can move. No, so, so basically this slide is showing how our index varied over time from our baseline through to our plan, through execution, through remediation, I think the, you know, the ability to apply this or reveal this type of, of variation of behavior across geo sellers by product helps pinpoint and, and, and the concept of, I think the question was with regards to leveraging trends, you know, using this as a predictive looking forward you know, because we can see how the, the behavior is changing over time, we can use it as predictive. But I think most importantly, using it in context, again, of specific geos, specific sellers, uh, specific uh, product offerings, even specific points throughout the year. And, and being able to leverage the index as we, you know, as you progress through the first stage of my plan to does it align with my goal to how am I executing against it to if things tend if things things go off plan? What's my recovery path? Um, 
get back on track and the achievability of that plan at every step in that process. Yeah, because because really what we're trying to do here, Paul, is keep within um, basically keep within the green. And so you know, as we uh, diverge away from the green, that that upper segment, um, again, use the impact drivers to tell us why are we diverging and focus 100% on addressing those so that that sinusoidal wave, you know, the, the, the peaks and troughs, first of all, you want them to get as small as possible. But in addition, you want that line to sit flat, flat within the green.